If you're interested in knowing how Oregon's tax system is put together, you're watching the right video. We recorded the webinar, Oregon Tax System Explained, on October 28th. My name is Juan Carlos Ordonez, Communications Director for the Oregon Center for Public Policy. If you like this video, please hit the like button and subscribe to our YouTube channel. You can also go to ocpp.org and sign up for our email newsletter. Now, without further ado, here's the recording of Oregon Tax System Explained. I'm going to start today's presentation with an image. Take a close look at it and, and put into the chat. Uh, this is the one time we're going to use the chat in this presentation, but use the chat feature and write down the any direct connections you see in this image to the public sector, the public structures that all of us fund together as, as Oregonians. So again, use the chat feature and put in what, what references to the public sector you see. Someone mentioned uh, public roads, definitely our transportation system, Southern Oregon University, right? Our public colleges and universities, traffic lights, certainly part of the public in infrastructure, street lights, um, education. That's a good one. I'll get to that in a second. Um, roads, public safety, the fire truck, yes. <laughs> Civic life. Let me show you what I came up with. So these are the ones that came, that I came up with, and a lot of you have you have already identified. So uh, I think pretty much all of them. I, I someone mentioned uh, um, civic spaces. Certainly, I, I you, I'm pointing here to the trees of a public park or green spaces for sure. Recre recreation areas. I think all of the other ones. Uh, I also sort of signaled the sidewalk. These are sort of the direct reference that come here, but there's there's other connections that sort of are below the surface, but are just as vital. As, as the connections that you've already identified. So the vast majority of children that appear in this image will have attended or are, or are attending uh, public schools. Also, a lot of the kids in this, in this photo will re receive their healthcare from the public sector. In fact, two out of five kids in Oregon gets their healthcare from the Oregon Health Plan, as do many adults as well. And just about every senior in the crowd here, uh, you know, gets their health care from the public sector, from from uh, Medicare, and there and they get retirement income from Social Security. What makes all of these public structures, all of these public services possible, is the fact that we have a system of revenue. Our system of revenue, our tax system, it what is what pays for the building blocks of our communities. You know, it's it's really hard to imagine that without a system of revenue that we would have much of something to call a state or, or a nation even. But while our system of revenue is absolutely vital, we have to recognize that it's falling short. Short in terms of addressing the needs and aspirations of Oregonians and of raising revenue in a way that the community recognizes as fair. So today we're gonna to be taking a look at Oregon's uh, system of revenue. And specifically, we're gonna focus on three things and I'm just gonna give you a preview. We're gonna start by looking at the basics of taxation, including some basic principles. So they were sort of all starting from the same page. Next, we are gonna spend the bulk of our time looking at how it is that Oregon's tax system is put together, the main building blocks of our revenue system. And then we're going to conclude by spending just a few minutes uh, quickly outlining some of the ways that we can make Oregon system uh, work better for all Oregonians, the key reforms, the key strategies that we think really make sense uh, to improve our tax system. Okay, so let's get started. And as I said, we're going to begin by looking at the basics of taxation. And we're going to start with a pretty basic question. Uh, what kinds of taxes are there? Well, we can basically group taxes into three categories, put them into three buckets, depending on what it is that gets taxed. So in the first bucket, uh, we, can, we can put taxes that uh, apply to what people consume. So in this bucket, we would see things like the sales tax. And a sales tax could apply to both uh, goods and services. Another thing that we can tax is what people earn. So examples of the kind of tax that we would see in this bucket are income taxes and uh, payroll taxes. 
And then the third category would be the things that people own. So examples of this would be property taxes uh, and the estate tax. Now, some of these taxes can apply to both people and corporations, but it is important to recognize that at the end of the day, it is people who directly or indirectly pay the taxes. States, by the way, uh, states like Oregon and, and, and all other states don't rely on just one tax to pay for public services. They rely on a combination of taxes. So how do we know uh, whether we have a good uh, tax system uh, at all? In other words, what makes for a good tax system? Public finance experts have, over the years, developed a number of criteria uh, by which to evaluate tax systems. And the list of criteria that they use can uh, vary depending on who you ask, and the list can be rather long. There's a lot of things to consider when assessing what makes for a good tax system. The Oregon Center for Public Policy, a couple of years ago, uh, helped convene a, a roundtable of a couple of dozen organizations representing uh, the labor community, uh, uh, community-based organizations, communities of color, the faith community, and many other groups uh, that took part in a number of sessions where we discuss what, re what really are the top principles for evaluating, evaluating Oregon's tax system and what principles really ought to guide tax policy in our state. And I'm gonna share with you the top three principles that we uh, together identify. The first principle is the principle of progressivity. And progressivity is a long-standing principle of tax fairness. Uh, it basically focuses on the question, does the tax system ask more proportionally of the rich person than of the poor person? If it does, then it is a progressive tax, or a, if you're looking at the whole tax system, a progressive tax system. But if it doesn't, if it asks proportionally more of the poor person than of the rich person, then it is a regressive tax and it fails this principle of progressivity. And I'm gonna take a minute to illustrate this uh, idea of what a regressive tax is. And I'm gonna use the hypothetical Smith family here, and I'm gonna apply the, uh, take a look at, the, at Oregon's gas tax to illustrate this point. So here we have the Smith family, which is a uh, low to moderate income family. This family makes $36,000 a year. And we assume that this family consumes a thousand gallons of gasoline in a year. Oregon, uh, you may or may not know, has a 36 cents per gallon gas tax. So on a yearly basis, this family will pay $360 in gas taxes. As a share of income, that adds up to 1% of this family's total income. So now let's compare this family to the hypothetical Jones family. And the Jones family is a high income family. They bring in $360,000 a year. And that puts them not quite at the top 1%, uh, but probably in the top two or 3% of income earners here in Oregon. So most definitely a high income family. Now, this family drives fancier cars, uh, but at the end of the, of, the, of the day, they spend the same, they consume the same amount of gasoline in a year and they pay the same gas tax. So on a yearly basis, they pay the same amount, $360. But as a share of income, that only, that only adds up to 0.1%, one tenth of 1%. Uh, and this is really the key for showing that it is a regressive tax and a very regressive tax at that. Uh, if this were a progressive tax, the high income family would be paying a higher share of their income in, in taxes. So, why is progressivity such an important principle that we would list it first among all our principles of taxation? Well, let's consider what $100 means to a poor family compared to a rich family. For a single mom surviving on low wages, $100 may be the difference between being able to cover rent that month or not going hungry in, in this particular month. But for a rich family, $100 may just be the cost of buying a bottle of champagne. So it really is the case that $100 is worth more to the poor family than to the rich family. And progressivity has always been an important principle of taxation, but it is especially important in today's day and age because we are living in a period of historic levels 
of wealth and income inequality. The second principle of taxation that we identified is the principle of adequacy. And the principle of adequacy asks the basic question, does the tax system raise enough revenue to meet the needs and aspirations of Oregonians? So for example, if the vast majority of Oregonians want to make sure that all children in our state receive a quality education, and yet our tax system consistently fails to deliver enough revenue so that every child can enjoy a quality education, then our tax system is falling short. It is inadequate. The third principle of taxation that we identified is the principle of equity, as in racial and gender equity. We need to recognize that tax policy doesn't exist in a vacuum. It reflects and impacts the larger political and economic forces of its time. And tax policy alone didn't create the very obvious racial and gender inequities that we see in today's society, but it has played a part in creating those inequities. And it continues to play a part in perpetuating some of those inequities. I should say that there's a lot of new and exciting research in this area of tax policy and equity. And in fact, we're gonna delve a lot deeper into this topic in an upcoming presentation on November 18th. So please do stay tuned uh, for information on that event. Now, with those principles in mind, um, let's switch to our next uh, section, which is uh, looking at Oregon's tax structure. In other words, how does Oregon specifically raise revenue for public purposes. And obviously this is a huge topic. I mean, one can spend uh, you know, a whole week looking at all the nooks and crannies, or maybe more looking at all the nooks and crannies in Oregon's tax system. Uh, but given the, our limited amount of time, we can actually get quite a bit of information uh, about Oregon's tax system in this uh, next slide. And here I am listing the top taxes uh, levied in Oregon. Um, in the just concluded uh, budget period. And you may know that Oregon uh, uh, puts together uh, budgets that last two years, so uh, uh, a biennium. And these were the top revenue raisers during the just concluded uh, budget period. Now I'm putting in the dollar figures corresponding to each of the taxes, um, but I should caution you not to get too hung up on the dollar figure because how much any one source of revenue brings in varies from year to year. Uh, there's a certain amount of volatility in the system. And also uh, taxes uh, often and should grow uh, alongside our economy. So the actual amount that, that any one tax brings in um, you know, varies from year to year and from uh, biennium to biennium. The really most important thing, the main takeaway from this slide is that there are really two uh, pillars of taxation here in Oregon. And then what we really, really need to focus on is the magnitude of these various uh, sources of taxation. And as I said, there's two main pillars of taxation, which is something really fundamental to understand about Oregon's tax system. And those two pillars are the personal income tax and the property tax. Now, I'm going to say, go a little bit deeper into the personal income tax uh, a little bit later in the presentation. Let me say about the property tax that uh, there's a reason why it's uh, in a different shade of blue here. Uh, it stands out from the other taxes that I have listed here. And the reason is because of all the taxes listed here, it is the only one that is assessed at the local level. All the other ones listed here are state level taxes. And the property tax, in fact, is the main way that Oregon, uh, the local governments in Oregon pay for uh, public services, for local services. So the property tax is the main way we fund things like libraries and parks and recreation. And a good chunk of it also goes to K through 12 education. The next item on the list is unemployment insurance, the unemployment insurance tax. And this is a tax that uh, is assessed on employers uh, and all of the funds raised from unemployment insurance go into a special fund to pay out un uh, unemployment insurance benefits. Uh, benefits for workers who have lost their job through no fault of their own. And we saw, we see every time during the recession, during recessions, and we saw it in the most recent recession, what a vital public structure unemployment insurance is. Sure, the, there's uh, technological problems with the 
uh, our unemployment insurance system, but as a system that helps prop up the economy during rough economic periods and help keep families afloat, uh, is that it is absolutely vital. One thing that you do not see on this slide is a general sales tax, uh, because Oregon famously is one of the few states in the country that does not levy a general sales tax. And Oregonians have rejected efforts to establish a sales tax at the ballot box uh, nine times already. But while we don't have a general sales tax, we do have what are called excise taxes. And excise taxes, you can think of, it, of them as sales taxes on particular types of good, on specific types of goods. So here I have listed the seven uh, uh, most important uh, excise taxes that we have on the, uh, here in Oregon. So for example, we have the gas tax, uh, the weight and mile tax, which is the, the gas tax for trucks, if you will. We have cigarette, tobacco, beer and wine, and most recently established uh, the cannabis tax. If we were to lump all of these excess taxes uh, into one tax, it, they would together make up the fourth largest source of revenue for the state. So certainly not an insignificant sum. And rounding out the list is the corporate income tax, which is a tax on corporate profits. Uh, one thing that uh, to know about the corporate income tax is that it is a tax that has been in a long-term decline, as I will go into more detail later. And the, uh, the corporate income tax uh, is many years, it would not crack the top five list. And in fact, it's very likely that the next time we put this uh, slide together that for the next budget period, a new tax will have made it onto this list. And that tax is the corporate activity tax. The corporate activity tax is, uh, was established by the Oregon legislature in, in 2019. Uh, and it is a ta mo fairly modest tax on, on businesses with Oregon sales above a million dollars. And the tax applies only to the sales above that amount. And this tax is uh, expected to bring in more than $2 billion uh, uh, going forward per budget period. And all of that money uh, is uh, dedicated to education, to K through 12 education and preschool education. All the money is supposed to be deposited in, in a fund for education. Now, uh, this actually brings up uh, an important point to uh, understand about taxes and different taxes and how they're put together. And that is that some taxes are dedicated. They are dedicated for particular uses, such as, uh, as I just mentioned, the corporate activity tax is dedicated to, to K through 12 schools and preschool education. Uh, another example would be the unemployment insurance tax that I also already talked about, which is dedicated for unemployment insurance benefits. But there are other taxes that are general in nature. Uh, the legislature has flexibility in how to best to allocate those resources. And all of those dollars, flexible dollars, go into to fund what, what we call the state budget, what people typically refer to as the Oregon state budget. Uh, its technical name is the Oregon General Fund. So let's take a quick look at the Oregon state budget and see what it pays for. And here we have a picture of the Oregon state budget. And this is for the current budget period, but it, but it doesn't look too different in other budget periods, uh, give or take a little bit. Um, but education is always the main, the main component, uh, taking up about half of all state budget dollars. Uh, then comes health and human services, the services that protect the most vulnerable Oregonians, and then public safety making up the third biggest chunk. So, where does the money come from specifically to pay for, for the state budget? You may already know the answer based on uh, one of the earlier slides that I showed, but just to make it clear, the biggest source of funding for the state budget is the personal income tax, the taxes that you and I pay out of our earnings. It is far and away the biggest source of funding for state budget dollars. Nothing, nothing comes remotely close to it. So given its importance to Oregon's uh, system of revenue, we're gonna dive in a little bit deeper into the personal income tax and see how it is structured. And here in this slide, I am showing you the tax brackets for the current year, 2021. 
And Oregon has four tax brackets that range from a low of 4.75% uh, to a high of 9.9%. I've paired these tax brackets with the amount of taxable income that corresponds to those tax brackets. And by the way, the taxable income amount that I'm showing here is the, the amount for joint filers. In other words, for couples that file taxes together. For individuals, uh, the corresponding income amounts are roughly half of what you see here. And the way this works is that the first income up to $7,300 is taxed at the lowest rate of 4.75% and so on up the ladder. So in other words, even Phil Knight and his spouse, uh, and Phil Knight, of course, being Oregon's richest person, will pay 4.75% on their first $7,300 of income and so on up the ladder. This is what's meant by marginal tax uh, rates in, ca in case you've heard the term. Um, in other words, no one, uh, even Phil Knight, will pay 9.9% on the of, uh, tax rate on their entire income. The 9.9% tax bracket only applies to income above the quarter million dollar threshold. The good news about Oregon's tax system is that it is a progressive tax structure. The more taxable income you have, the, the higher the tax rate there you will tend to pay. So that's, that's the good news. The bad news is that it is only mildly progressive. And you can see that here in this next to highest tax bracket of 8.75%. It doesn't take a whole lot of taxable income to land you in this uh, second to highest tax bracket. In other words, and what, what this tells us is that a couple with taxable income of just $20,000 will pay the same tax rate on their last dollar earned as a family that pulls in a quarter million dollars. So again, we have a progressive income tax system here in Oregon, but mildly progressive. Now, as I showed before, Oregonians don't just pay the personal income tax. It is the biggest source of revenue for the state, but there are other taxes that Oregonians pay. We have property taxes, we have excise taxes, and other taxes that Oregonians pay. So what does our tax system look like overall when you add up all of these uh, sources of revenue, all the taxes that Oregonians pay? This is what it looks like. When you add up all state and local taxes assessed here in Oregon, you end up with an upside down tax system, a regressive tax system that asks proportionally more to lower income Oregonians than to the very richest Oregonians. On the left-hand column here, we have the lowest earning 20% of Oregonians. And they pay on average 12.8% uh, of their entire income on state and local taxes. So again, a regressive tax structure. By the way, I, I should mention that in this respect, Oregon is not that different than the rest of the country. In fact, nearly all states around the country have an overall regressive tax structure. Uh, some like Washington state have it much worse. There's only a handful of states that have a what you might even call a progressive tax structure. And even those that do, it is very, very mi uh, mildly progressive. Let's pivot now and talk about some of the major trends that we have been seeing with respect to Oregon's tax system over the past few decades that help explain how it is that we end up with a regressive tax structure, some of the factors that have affected this over the past few decades. Starting in the 1970s, we begin to see the rise of what some people refer to as neoliberalism or free market fundamentalism, what, whatever you want to call this movement or ideology that began to take root and really began to uh, have a huge impact into our economy and in our tax system. And in some ways uh, helps explain the great deal of economic inequality that we see today. The political and economic forces behind this, this movement were pushing to uh, reduce spending on public services, to shrink the public sector, and shrink also uh, taxation, especially for corporations and for the rich. So during this period, we begin to see certain trends emerge. Um, and the first trend that we, that we want to note is we begin to see progressive forms of revenue and retreat. And Really, a perfect example of this is the decline of the corporate income tax. Corporations are owned by, by shareholders. They are the owners. And 
shares tend to be highly concentrated amongst the rich. It is they who primarily own the corporations. The corporate income tax is a very progressive form of taxation that mainly falls on the corporate shareholders. So if you go back to the 1970s, this is what you would see. You would see that the corporate income tax, and that is the slice shown in red, was bringing in about 19% of all the income taxes collected by the state of Oregon. With the personal income tax, the slice uh, in blue, uh, bringing in the rest. So while the personal income ta tax was still the biggest driver of, in uh, of income taxes, the corporate income tax was bringing in a pretty healthy 19% of all income taxes collected by Oregon. If you fast forward to today, this is what you see. And these are the figures for the uh, estimates for the current budget period. And what you see is that the corporate income tax slice has shrunk to about 6%. And this is roughly what we've been seeing over the, over the past few budget periods, uh, a massive relative decline in the corporate contribution. And there's no big mystery as to how it is that we have arrived at this situation. The reality is that uh, corporations have been engaging in very aggressive forms of tax avoidance over the years. Corporations have, for example, uh, employed uh, offshore tax havens. You may have heard this term before, but it would, what it basically means is artificially moving profits from the place where they are actually earned, like for example, Oregon in the US, and moving them to a jurisdiction that assesses little or no corporate income tax. Corporations have also uh, have armies of lobbyists that go to the Oregon legislature and to Capitol Hill to uh, lobby for new corporate uh, tax loopholes and, and tax subsidies. Uh, and they also have armies of lawyers that look to stretch those tax loopholes uh, in new and innovative ways. But it's not, by the way, just corporations. I mean, uh, the fact is that there's also we've seen also a growth in the number of tax breaks and tax loopholes that benefit the most well off Americans and Oregonians. Another trend that we have seen over the decades is sort of the, the uh, flip side of this, and that is the, that regressive forms of revenue have been, have been in, in advance. A good example of this is the rise of the Oregon lottery. And the Oregon lottery is not technically speaking a tax, but it is nevertheless a very important source of revenue, has become an important source of revenue for the state. And in fact, many years, the Oregon lottery brings in more revenue into state coffers than the corporate income tax. Studies have shown that lotteries tend to draw most of the revenue from low income folks, as well as people with a gambling addiction. So lotteries are a very regressive form of revenue raising. And you should know that the Oregon lottery didn't come into existence until 1984. And as I mentioned, many today, it has grown to be such an important source of revenue for the state that in many years, it brings in more revenue than the corporate income tax. The next trend that we have been seeing is the rise of structural barriers, structural barriers to achieving adequacy, to having an adequate tax system. And again, the movement uh, that, be, that sought to uh, shrink the public sector and cut taxes for corporations, for the rich, did a lot of work at the state level. So groups like, if you've heard of Grover Norquist and his group, uh, Americans for Tax Reform, in the 1970s, beginning of the 1970s, uh, they really began to make efforts in, the, in states across the country to change the tax systems, to change the tax structures of those states. And in Oregon, this movement, these efforts really began to pay off in the decade of the 1990s. And in that decade, we saw drastic changes to Oregon's tax system in just the span of one decade. So uh, the first big change that we saw was in 1990 with the enactment of Measure 5. And Measure 5 established property tax limits. It put in a limit into how, how much any one property in Oregon can be taxed. And this ushered in uh, massive changes to the way local governments fund local services because Measure 5 severely restricted their ability to raise revenue for public purposes. It also began a long, the long chronic underfunding of Oregon public schools because property taxes had been the main, the main way that Oregon funded uh, its, uh, its public schools. 
The next big change uh, that we see took place in 1996 with the enactment of the supermajority requirement. Before 1996, it was the case that uh, democracy ruled when it came to tax policy. A simple majority of the legislature could decide to raise taxes, uh, establish a new tax, or raise tax rates. But the uh, supermajority requirement established in 1996 via a ballot uh, measure made it so that you now require a three-fifths vote of both the Oregon House and the Oregon Senate to establish a new tax or raise tax rates. In other words, when it comes to tax policy in Oregon, uh, basic democratic principles don't apply. In this case, the minority holds the power, the power to block any change that the, major that the majority of Oregonians may want to see. Uh, and in fact, it's a minority that can, that can be most easily beholden to special interests. And we've, in fact, we've seen that over and over again over the years. Another big change that we saw was, took place in 1997 with the enactment of Measure 50, which put in place yet another, another limit on property taxes. This time it put in a limit as to how much any one taxing district, like say a school district or a library district can raise from property taxes. Measure 97 also changed the formula for assessing property taxes, real market, the real market value of a property, and established a artificial assessed value that has created a lot of complexity and inequity in our tax system. The interplay and the impact of measures five and 50, uh, it's a huge topic, very, uh, it can get super wonky and you can spend a lot of time going into the details of it. Um, but just to, just to keep it short, I mean, the really the main, one of the main impacts of these, of these measures has been that they have severely restricted the ability of local governments to raise revenue for public purposes. The last big change that we saw took place in the year 2000. So I said a decade, but it's a decade in one year. So uh, the year 2000, we saw the elevation of the kicker into the Oregon constitution. And the kicker existed before 2000, uh, but it, it, this year uh, in 2000, it got elevated and put into the constitution via a ballot measure. And the kicker is in essence a, an unanticipated tax cut a very regressive tax cut um, that kicks in when more revenue comes in than what state economists predicted two years earlier. And again, the kicker is a fairly complicated uh, piece of tax policy. So it would take quite a while to go into all the, all the uh, details of this tax policy. But one of the main take things to keep in mind about the kicker is that it, it is a very regressive tax cut. And just to give you a sense of how regressive it is, we learned just a few months ago that there's a new kicker on the way that Oregonians will claim in their tax returns uh, when they file uh, next year. And this kicker will add up to a total of $1.9 billion. So it's a huge kicker that's on the way, money that we could be spending uh, in, in many ways to address the needs of Oregonians. This money, just to give you a sense of how it's gonna be spent, the richest 1% of Oregonians are gonna get tax cuts are worth on average about $17,000. And some Oregonians, some very rich Oregonians are gonna get kicker uh, rebates even bigger than that. Meanwhile, the lowest earning Oregonians will get kicker rebates of just about on average about $30. Uh, so practically nothing. So it is a massively regressive uh, piece of tax policy. The kicker is also one of the biggest impediments that we have in terms of being able to put aside uh, revenue to have on hand during uh, economic recessions, to be able to keep public services going. The four changes that I've outlined uh, here were all changes to Oregon's constitution, which is why they are truly structural changes, changes, changes that make them the most serious structural obstacles that we have in terms of reforming our tax system and making it work better for all Oregonians. But speaking of making the tax system uh, work better for Oregonians, we're going to now, before we get to your questions, we're going to spend a few minutes talking about the way forward, how we can, the kinds of strategies and reforms that we would like to see that we think make sense to making our tax system work better for everyone. The first change, the first strategy that one can think of that makes a whole lot of sense is closing tax loopholes for corporations and the rich. 
And there's a lot of work that we can do in this area because there's simply a lot of tax loopholes and subsidies out there. And one of the benefits of this strategy is that you do not run into the supermajority requirement. A simple majority of the legislature has the power to close a tax loophole. So in terms of what's politically viable, closing tax loopholes and subsidies is definitely uh, uh, an approach that has a lot of appeal. Another strategy that one can think of pursuing in order to make our tax system work better is raising tax rates on the rich in corporations. Again, there's a lot of room to work here, um, given that we have an upside down tax system that asks proportionally more of the poor than of the rich. You know, in terms of what it could look like, there's many ways you can go about it. But just to give you an example, some states in the past couple of years have enacted what they call a millionaire's tax. So you could you could set a new tax rate on Oregonians with income above a million dollars, or you could maybe set it at half a million dollars. But that's that's the general idea of setting a higher tax bracket for, for the very rich. And one of the benefits of this uh, is that uh, it tends to be very popular with Oregonians. Polls consistently show that Oregonians and Americans by and large, um, a very solid majority of them think that the rich in corporations are not paying their fair share. So politically, uh, it, it can be uh, viable as well. Another strategy that we would recommend is cutting taxes on lower income Oregonians. Again, uh, we saw earlier how our overall tax structure, when you add up all state and local taxes together, they, they weigh more heavily on lower income Oregonians. They proportionally, they pay more than those at the very top. So it is certainly very appropriate to cut taxes uh, uh, for lower income Oregonians. And, and one of the most straightforward ways to do doing so is through using tax credits, such as expanding Oregon's earned income tax credit, a tax credit that is targeted uh, at low at Oregonians who survive on low wages. The next strategy that we would recommend, and this does start to get into the more difficult political lift, is removing or reforming the structural barriers that we outlined earlier. So for example, this would be uh, reforming or removing the property tax limits, measures five and 50, and finding ways to make them more equitable if we reform them. With respect to the supermajority requirement, really the only uh, equitable thing to do here is to get rid of it altogether and let democracy once again rule when it comes to tax policy. And uh, with respect to the kicker, short of getting rid of the kicker, we do think that there are equitable ways to reform this tax policy. And we're cer certainly happy to share those, our thoughts on how we can have an equitable reform of the kicker during Q&A. The last strategy that we would recommend is increasing transparency in our tax system, shining the light in our tax system so that we can better understand how it is working or how we can improve it to make it work better for all Oregonians. And really the place to start here is with large corporations, requiring large corporations to make public certain key tax information and financial information so that we can better understand how it is that the corporate income tax system has uh, declined so, so massively over the decades uh, and how we can reform it to make, make it work better for Oregonians. In conclusion, uh, before we get to your questions, let me say that reforming our tax system uh, for the better is no doubt difficult, difficult political work. Tax policy is a very contested area of public policy. Um, but as difficult as it may be, it is absolutely vital if we want to have a, an Oregon that works well for all Oregonians, if we want to have economic and racial justice in our state. And just to leave you on a positive note, um, it is possible to reform our tax system because if you think about it, Oregonians built the tax system. So it is within our power to fix it. We hope you enjoyed the video. If you would like to learn more about tax policy in Oregon, please visit ocpp.org backslash tax. And remember, please hit the like button on this video and subscribe to our YouTube channel.